So Amrish will uh, introduce. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, then we'll start uh, the talk. OK, please. OK, so hello, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, my friend and uh, yeah, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Akshay Bhatnagar. So uh, he did his MSc from MSc in Physics Department from IIT Kanpur in 2010, and he got his PhD uh, with Professor Rahul Pandit from IIC Bangalore in 2016. And after that, he was working in Nordita, uh, uh, Stockholm, with Professor Dhrubadit Mitra. And uh, yeah, so he works in Lagrangian uh, turbulence, I hope. Uh, yeah, so yes. with, with particle, yeah. Yes. Uh, he tracks particle and uh, he studies turbulence using Lagrangian uh, formulation. So yeah, today he will talk about relative velocities of particles in turbulence. So Akshay, floor is yours. Thank you, Ambrish. And thank you all for giving me this opportunity to present my work here. So as Amrish said, I will talk about the relative velocity of velocities of particles which are being advected by turbulent flow. And I will tell you why we are interested in these things. And uh, let me start. So just to uh, give you a motivation, there are a lot of places in nature and in, uh, in our surrounding world where we come across small sized particles which are suspended in a turbulent flow. Uh, so some of the examples are mentioned here. Uh, uh, to start with, uh, uh, there, there are clouds. So you have small water droplets or small particles in clouds, which move around due to the turbulence there. And uh, I'll come to this example in more detail uh, after a slide. And another example is, of course, comes from the astrophysics. So there are around a young star, there are often found these disks, which are called protoplanetary disks, which have gas and then dust particles suspended in them. And these dust particles also move around in a turbulent flow of that gas. And then there's a sandstorm. So you have these small sand particles suspended in a turbulent air or pollutant dispersions coming out of a chimney. So these are a few examples, but why then we are interested in particular about looking at the relative velocities of these particles. So there are two main motivations because of which one does so. Uh, by the way, I, I, I am happy if you ask questions during the talk also. So please feel free to jump in and just stop me and ask the question. So, okay. So the uh, reason why we are interested in studying the relative velocity of particles so the first main motivation comes from the cloud uh, physics and the physics of raindrop formation in the clouds. So what are clouds? For the for for our simple purpose, clouds are uh, clouds have super saturated air. So there are a lot lot of water vapor mixed with the air, and it's it's in the super saturated state. And then you have some small particles, some dust particles, some aerosols. What we uh, I mean some uh, pollens or they could be I mean, many kind of different, many different kind of particles. They're very small and tiny, and they just move around in the turbulent environment. And then when uh, to have because a saturated water vapor uh, can't rain, so you have to have formed drop uh, water droplets in order to have rain. So what happens is initially this water vapor condense starts condensating on these small particles. This process is called initiation, activation, or initiation. I mean, uh, and then uh, these small droplets, then they grow by condensation. But there's a problem. Condensation is a very, very slow process. So you can't have a droplet of millimeter size that we see on the earth just solely due to condensation, because then it will take months or years to form that droplet starting from a very small droplet. So after 10 micrometer droplet, it's very difficult to get larger droplets in practical time interval just due to condensation. So then the idea is because clouds have turbulence. So these the, this turbulence also mixes up these particles and they make them collide and they merge and then they grow faster by this process of collision and coalescence. And that is why, why we are interested in the relative velocity of these colliding particles. The second example comes from the astrophysics, as I mentioned earlier also. 
so if you have seen these pictures of a solar system in any textbook then they are normally drawn in a plane and indeed they are actually most of the solar system that we have observed they all lie in a plane and all the planets rotate in the in a way that they they their angular moment about the sun coincide with the spin of the sun and there are many such observations that suggest that these planets are formed in a disk so initially when a, a star is formed uh, there is a disk of gas and small dust particles around that star these disks are called protoplanetary disks and then basically if you want to have planets the, somehow they these part these dust particle need to grow so because they these particles are very small so they they can't feel gravitational attraction so they need to grow up to a size that they can feel gravitational attraction of each other and then collapse collapse and become large objects so in the initial stages of planet formation uh, the similar uh, idea applies as in the raindrop formation in the clouds so these small dust particles grow by collision and then they make larger objects until they can feel gravitational attraction and collapse and form larger <coughs> planetesimals or planets now if you want to look at the collision so you need to look at the relative velocity because i'll come in a moment on that so uh, now if we can if you want to think about these particles so the simplest kind of particles that one can think about are called tracer particles so these particles just move with the flow velocity so can you see my cursor also when i move it yes yes yeah, yeah i can see yes. yeah yeah please ah okay okay good thank you right so the tracer particle move with the flow velocity <coughs> uh, so this is the equation of motion for the tracer particle and the velocity of this tracer particle is exactly same as the velocity of the flow at the position of the particle so now if i have two such particles nearby at a separation r and this separation separation is compared to the dissipation scale so then the relative velocity of these particles are u2 minus u1 and uh, if the separation is smaller than the kolmogorov scale i can say that it's the velocity gradient times the separation between them because i can linearize the flow there it's smooth if you are inside the dissipation range and you can estimate this uh, velocity gradient tensor using the kolmogorov's idea of dimensional analysis and this can be given by square root of epsilon by nu where epsilon is the mean energy dissipation rate of the turbulence and nu is the kinematic viscosity so people tried uh, and then if you want to uh, know what's the collision rate of the particles so here i give the expression of the collision of the particle in terms of the relative velocity v and the sigma is the basically when they uh, when these particles collide the separation between them should be a1 plus a2 where a1 and a2 are their radii respectively uh, and g of r is the radial distribution function uh, at that separation so this for a uniformly distribution par a distributed particle this is just unity and if there is some sort of clustering or correlation between the particles position then this thing this can change so then this capital v we can say that it, it all the particles are tracers so we can uh, estimate this capital v using the uh, kolmogorov's idea and put back into this expression of the collision frequency or the uh, collision rate r and safman turner did it in 1955 and they came up with this ex expression so there are some geometrical factors of course n0 is the mean density of the particles i think i missed n0 in the first expression for the r yes there should be an n not here also <coughs> and then a1 and a2 are their radii and tau k is the dissipation time scale of the turbulence because this uh, velocity gradient is just inverse of that uh, one second uh, and then uh, when you plug in the typical parameters for a cloud you get a number which is like 10 to the minus 6 so that means there will be one collision in 10 to the 6 seconds so which means uh, it will be very difficult to form larger objects in hours or so because there will be in 10 to the 6 seconds there will be just one collision so this is not enough yes, so then we can think can about question because these droplets don't move sure okay. yes 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 so, so the sigma is uh, normally the in classical physics the cross so collision rate is proportional to the cross section no 
now it is cross section cube uh, for you right uh, yes yes but so these are like hard it? spheres so for them it's like we just pi r square i see so a is a radius you see, not the cross section even you see this pi r square pi sigma square factor here okay i see okay sigma square so this is that cross section factor so sigma is a radius because they are hard cross section sigma is a what sigma, sigma is, is the sum of the radii yes i see, I see. okay okay i i see um but uh, yeah okay. area area but uh, the cube is coming because of what i mean that is uh, a square a1 by a2 square uh, why is cube uh, is there a motivation for that uh, or v v is a uh, in the, in this v expression one. yes 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 v has yes, a1 yes. Plus so v. this is because this capital v uh -huh. this also has a a1 plus a2 i see relative velocity is proportional to the distance yes because it's they are tracer particles so then the if they are very nearby then their relative velocity is just the velocity gradient times the separation between them i see yes. and separation okay. between them is a1 plus a2 when they are colliding okay please go on yeah. so thank one you. a1 plus a2 comes from here and the other one is just this geometric factor okay great thank you yes okay so okay so now then because we are we are thinking that all these particles move with the flow velocity they are tracers particle but that is not true because these particles will also have some inertia so they will they will also they will detach from the st flow streamline and move with their own dynamics so now we consider what we call heavy inertial particles so uh, these particles of course are very small compared to the kolmogorov length scale eta and they are very heavy compared to the surrounding fluid so their density rho p is much much higher than the flow density rho f and we assume it's a dilute suspension so they don't collide i mean they don't interact with each other and also they don't back react so i mean these particles will also change the flow around them but if it's a dilute suspension then the momentum transfer in the other direction the term that you will have in the navier stokes that will be very small compared to the other ter other terms which are there so we neglect the back reaction of these particles to the flow and in that case this uh, equation that governs the motion of these particles is this so v is the velocity of the particle and u is the velocity of flow at the particle position and tau s is the uh, what we call is the uh, response time or the stokes time of these particles because they have inertia so it will take them some time to respond to the change in the flow so that time scale is given by tau s and that time scale actually depends on the particles size a particles density rho p particles flow density rho f and new uh, viscosity of the uh, uh, surrounding fluid nu so if you look at this equation this actually is the simple equation that we have studied in our schools this that the drag on a particle when it's falling is 6 pi eta a v so this is actually that equation instead of v now i have v minus u because there is a velocity of the surrounding fluid okay so then basically we define uh, to measure the inertia of the particle we define a dimensionless number which we call stokes number st which is this stopping time tau s divided by the uh, kolmogorov time scale tau eta so this is what measures the inertia of the particle so if this is zero that means they are tracer particle they don't have their inertia they just move with the flow velocity and if it's very high that means the inertia of the particle is very high so from here you can see that these particles won't move with the flow velocity they will have their own velocity which will be different from the flow velocity <coughs> okay and then the thing is that so far what i have discussed about this seffman turner thing this is only the mean of the collision rate but mean is normally not enough because there will be fluctuations uh, in the collision uh, uh, rate or relative velocities in the space because Uh, at some point you may have more particles nearby they will be colliding faster and this so this will be due to the fluctuations of the relative velocity so indeed we need to study the distribution of the fluctu uh, relative velocity uh, not just the mean <coughs> okay so then we perform the direct numerical simulations so to get the particle speed we need the flow velocity u so that we get by solving the navier stokes equation which is given here so this is not the usual incompressible navier stokes equation that we normally i mean write down where divergence of u is precisely zero but this is rather a compressible i mean the 
uh, we have a mass conserving uh, conservation and the momentum conservation and then we use the equation of state which is the isothermal equation of state to relate the pressure and uh, density and we try to keep the mach number as low as we can because uh, normally you are interested in the incompressible limit of this equation or weakly compressible limit of this equation because most of the flow that we are interested in are very low mach number flows uh, except uh, uh, unless you are interested in the astrophysics part of it <laughs> so this thing this we simulate using a code called pencil code which is an open source code uh, which is a finite difference solver it uses a runge kutta third order scheme and we did our simulations at 512 cube resolution and of our lambda up to 130 in most of the cases <clears throat> okay so now once we have these particles there we solve this equation and then we simultaneously solve the particles equation and then we can of course look at the snapshots of the particles so here i plot uh, it's they are, they are all 3d simulations but i am plotting a 2d slice of that uh, 3d box so here you see three panels on the top they are the particle position the blue dots here represent the particle position in the uh, xy plane for a given z and then uh, basically for three different values of stokes number so the first one is stokes number 0.1 which is very small stokes and you see that particles are more or less uniformly distributed there are hardly any inhomogeneities but on stokes 1 you see that these particles form clusters there are local regions where particle densities are very high and then again when you start increasing stokes at some stokes you will again have a uniform distribution so reason for that is that when you have very high inertia these particles don't even care about the flow they just move almost ballistically in a direction and then they receive random kicks in between from the flow so they again distributes uniformly in the space and to measure this clustering what we do is so if you can look at the bottom uh, left most uh, plot so what we consider a particle at the center and then we look in a small region of radius r and a small shell around this which is of thickness delta r and we count how many number of particles are there so because it's in 3d if you have a uniform distribution of particles then you will just have a r square dependence of this numbers you will just have a because the surface area of sphere is 4 pi r square and you will have n not times 4 pi r square dr particles in this so this will be proportional to r square the number of particles in this small region uh, but what we actually find is so here what i am plotting in the second plot is this number of particles divided by r square so if it's a uniform distribution of particle in space then it will be flat it will just be a horizontal line as you can see for very small strokes around 0.17 the red curve and then uh, on the x axis i have uh, is the separation uh, divided by the kolmogorov scale eta so uh, 10 to the 0 means 1 eta and 10 to the minus 2 means 100 of the eta so and you can see that this uh, shows a power law and there are basically more particles at small separation than there were when it, there was a uniform distribution and there is a non monotonic dependence of this clustering on stokes number so it first increases and then decreases uh, if you look at the point uh, which is for 2.78 it again comes down and uh, kind of becomes const, uh, r squared uh, close to r squared dependence so this exponent we fit uh, this is a log log plot so it's a power law and then we fit this exponent and we call this correlation dimension d2 Uh, as for very small r and this d2 as a function of stokes i'll show you in a moment but let me let me show you a, a example where people have actually observed this kind of clustering in a in a in a actual situation so in the clouds people have measured this part they have flown through the clouds and uh, note down the using various cameras and various techniques they have note down the position of these particles and then they have plotted the similar quantity that i was plotting the number of particles divided by r square but and they have more accurate normalization so they call it gr the radial distribution function and what they find is that in most of the in all the cases this gr shows a peak as you go to smaller and smaller r 
of course they could not go to small r and their data could not be as accurate as us so they can't fit a power law and they can't get the exponent d2 and uh, so if you look at the equation of motion for these particles it's a dissipative dynamics in the velocity position velocity phase space so you can show that the the trace of the of this matrix that will come in front of the uh, <coughs> that will be the jacobian of this dynamic that governs this dynamics uh, the trace would be negative and that means they cluster in the phase space the phase space uh, volume contracts so you can also calculate a phase space correlation dimension so what you do is you normalize your distances by eta you normalize your uh, relative velocities by v eta and then you define a phase space separation like this which what i am calling w and then you in the phase space you count number of particles in a, a, a small uh, region around a sphere in the sixth dimension and then we find that that thing goes as w to the power d2 minus 1 and this capital d2 is what we call phase space correlation dimension and this uh, so what we see in the real space as a clustering is just the projection of this cluster in the phase space <coughs> and uh, so there is this projection principle for these two dimensions that comes from the dynamical system <coughs> theory and for one of the stokes number i am showing you this number of particles in a small a uh, shell around a six dimensional sphere of radius w and you see a power law and you can get a capital d2 from here <coughs> and here so now we plot these two exponents the uh, real space correlation dimension and phase space correlation dimension as a function of the particle inertia which is uh, characterized by the stokes number so in the red here you see the uh, real space correlation dimension so when it's 3 there is no clustering and when it's below 3 that means there is clustering there are more particles will be found around a particle at small separations and the blue is the uh, <coughs> phase space correlation dimension so as you can see as you increase strokes the real space correlation dimension goes back to 3 that means in the real space you will have a uniform distribution of the particles but your phase space correlation dimension has still not gone to 6 that means the particles have will if you you could see the uh, phase space uh, distribution of the particle you will still see a clustering and this will become uniform when this becomes 6 to d <coughs> okay so now we start thinking about the relative velocities of the particles because that is what we were interested in so now we have two particles they are moving with velocity v1 and v2 respectively and the velocities of the flow at their positions are u1 and u2 and they are at a small because we are interested in the in very nearby particle because that is what determines the collision so r the separation between them is always less than the kolmogorov scale eta so their relative velocity is capital v which is just v2 minus v1 and the difference of the flow velocity at their position would be as i did earlier would just be the velocity gradient matrix a times the separation between them because flow is smooth <coughs> there i can linearize so now the equation of motion for these two particles i have written here i just copied the earlier equations and then i subtract them to get the relative velocities so i'll have a u2 minus u1 that i replace by a times r and i will have a v2 minus v1 that i replace by v so this is the equation of motion that governs the relative velocity and then the relative separation is just the dr dt is just the relative velocity <coughs> so from here you can see that in the case of tracer you you just had this one term a times r but here you have other term so at small separation when r will be very small actually this term would be negligible and the other term may dominate and it may do something else <coughs> so now what we are interested in is looking at the joint distribution of the relative velocity so we look at the radial component of this relative velocity which we call vr and if vr is negative that means these particles are coming towards each other and if it's positive that means they are going away from each other and throughout this talk my separation r is non dimensional it's non dimensionalized by kolmogorov scale eta and velocity or relative velocities are non dimensionalized by the uh, kolmogorov velocity scale u eta and now what i ask is what's the joint distribution function of this relative velocity and separation <clears throat> okay so here in this plot on the left side 
what i am plotting is the contours of the probability from from our simulation contours of the probability joint probability distribution functions of r and vr so on the x axis i have log of separation on the y axis i have log of the relative velocity the radial component of the relative velocity and this contour represents the probability joint probability of having a particular separation and a particular relative velocity <coughs> for a given stokes number which is 3.13 i mean the, the, the plots for other stokes number also looks very similar so now what we observe here is that if you look there's a there's a straight line here which basically joins all these corners so this this has slope just z star so this slope we, i mean we could say that this line is vr equals to z star times r and if you are in this region above this line then your contours are horizontal that means if you change your r you remain on the same contour for a given value of vr that means your joint probability doesn't depend on r in this region <clears throat> and if you are below this line here your contours are vertical that means your joint probability doesn't depend on vr if you change vr and fix your r then you basically move vertically on the same line so the value of the joint probability doesn't change so that means in this region it's just a function of r and then there's a line that separates these two regions this i mean this just this becomes very simple to characterize and understand so you just have a uh, one parameter z star that tells you about the uh, about this distribution qualitatively <clears throat> and uh, how does these two regimes appear so the region where it is just a function of r appears due to the this due, due to this term ar in the uh, equation of motion for the relative velocity because this is basic this is saying that your relative velocity depends on r so then everything depends on r and not on vr so then your joint probability becomes just a function of r and here your this term uh, becomes negligible because you are going to smaller and smaller separations so your this term becomes negligible and everything depends on v on the relative velocity because separation already depend on the relative velocity so your joint probability distribution function is a function of vr only <laughs> and now if i want to look at the uh, probability distribution function for a given r so i say what is the probability of having this relative velocity at this separation so i fix my separation so in this joint pdf you can see this vertical line i fix my separation at point 1 eta and i i plot this joint probability distribution function and i can normalize it to get the probability distribution function at that separation so up to z star r up to the value of vr when it's z star r i'll have a flat part and then what i see is interesting i see a power law regime here and then there's a cutoff so this is interesting because if you look at the single particle velocity in the in, uh, single velocity of the single particle in a turbulent flow uh, in mean particle which is a heavy particle which always this equation that i showed you uh, then the distribution of the velocity is gaussian but if you consider two nearby particle and look at the relative velocity of these two nearby particle then you see a power law distribution and this is because there is a correlation between their velocities which is coming from the flow <coughs> and the exponent of this power law actually depends on the phase space correlation dimension d2 that i showed you earlier so if i want to characterize these joint distributions i just need two things one is the z star and the other one is this exponent d2 if you go to there there will be higher probability of having a high relative velocity that means the particles will collide when they are very nearby they will collide with a very high relative velocity so that also increases the collision frequency but that that may also affect the outcome of the collision so if they they hit each other with a very high velocity relative velocity then they may actually fragment instead of merging they may break in small pieces so that is what the main result of the talk i guess and then i will go further so one is that the, this joint distribution has a very simple form and the if i look at the distribution at a given separation then there is a power law dimension and d is the dimensionality of the space of course <laughs> so means of this uh, relative velocity so what they do is they take uh, power p of this thing and then just 
average over that. So in our way of doing it, it will just be this joint distribution rho r comma vr times the vr to the p integrated over vr. And then from this distribution, what you find is that there's a, a bifractal nature. So there, there are two scaling exponents that you get. One is just d minus one. So that doesn't depend on p. <clears throat> and we will have earlier plotted these things, but I think they didn't understand how it's coming from. So these thing, if you if you look at the plot on the bottom right, so at small separations, there's another exponent, uh, there's a different exponent compared to what is there, uh, a two-third exponent uh, is there for the uh, higher separation. This is the second order structure function or the second moment, oh, sorry. And then zeroth moment of this distribution actually gives you the uh, correlation dimension d2. So if you understand this joint distribution, then you understand a lot of things. You understand about the moments and so on. Now, so far I have considered only the particles, both the particles having the same Stokes number, same inertia, but that is not, that will not be true in a, in a practical situation. So you will have particles having different sizes. That means different Stokes numbers that will be colliding with each, with each other. So now I consider two particles having Stokes number ht1 and ht2, and then uh, uh, what we found is it's better to characterize them not in terms of Stokes number one and Stokes number two, but rather define two two other parameters. One is Stokes bar or Stokes m mean Stokes, which is basically the harmonic mean of these two Stokes, and then the theta, which is the difference between the two strokes divided by the sum of these two strokes. So theta characterizes the difference between the strokes and then ST bar is kind of mean strokes. And if you want your ST1 and ST2 back, you can use this. But the joint distribution, same way for, for this by dispersed thing, when my strokes bar or strokes M is two and theta is 0 0.01. So their, their difference between the strokes is not too large. What I find is, kind of the similar nature, except that they are now two new scales. So in this region, it's a function of VR only. In this region, it's a function of R only as I got in the case of monodispersed case or the when two particles have same strokes number. But now I have a scale RC and a scale VC in the velocity, relative velocity and in the separation. If you are below this, you don't see, a, see this kind of nature. You see a constant. So their distribution is flat. <coughs> and now, I mean, just schematically, so that is what we see. So this RC and VC actually depends on theta and of course, ST bar and other parameters. I'll, I'll show you that dependence in a moment. <clears throat> so now schematically, what I find, what we find is that there are three regimes, three regimes in the R VR plane. So in one region, it's just a function of R. In another region, it's just a function of VR. And below a scale RC and VC, it's constant. And if you want to plot this distribution for a given separation, then you will see same thing. But if you are below this RC, then basically your this constant part would not depend on your R. <clears throat> Here I am plotting the same distributions for a given value of ST bar or STM, but for different theta. And you see that this constant region keeps as I increase theta, as I increase the difference between the two strokes. This region, which is constant, keeps growing. And it, it kind of, uh, in the last plot, you can see the boundaries almost go. <laughs> and now for different, in the bottom line, I plot this joint distribution functions for different values of R. And if you could see, you can see that if I'm below uh, RC, all the distribution just coincide with each other. And if I above RC, then of course the, the constant part continues up to Z star times R, and then there's a power law. <laughs> Now we look at this dependence of these two scales, RC and VC on Stokes number and theta. So what we find is that they are linear in theta. As you increase theta, both these scales grow linearly. And they are also, I mean, we try a fit, which is a square root of ST bar. So the dependence on ST bar or STM is one by square root of ST bar or STM. I mean, I'm just... Uh, I think I have just messed up with the symbols. I, some places I've used STM and some places I've used ST bar. So my apologies for that. 
but uh, basically what what we show here is that there's a one by square root f st bar dependence and there's a linear dependence in theta <clears throat> now if you want to look at the correlation dimension as a function of st bar so the black curve is for the mono dispersed case so basically theta equals to 0 and as you increase theta slightly basically they don't change. they remain almost the same and same for this z star the black curve is for theta equals to 0 that means for the same when both the stokes number are same and then uh, when theta is small and i plot them as a function of steep bar they just lie on that curve so for small theta basically these suspension behave this bi dispersed thing behave as if each of them has a stokes number st bar <clears throat> now the next question is if your theta is large because all these things were for very small theta theta 0.1 theta 0 0.05 and so on but what happens if your theta is large so what that means is one of the stokes number goes to zero then theta becomes one so here i'm plotting uh, this joint distribution and of course uh, the on the right side the distribution for a given value of r and you can see that there is no power law power but rather there is exponential tail so how do we understand this when theta goes to one so now here what i am considering is let's say one particle is very small the red one and this is like almost like a tracer particle so stokes number is zero and the velocity of this particle is the flow velocity and the other particle that has stokes number st1 its velocity is v so now i'm interested in the relative velocity of these two parts look at the variance of this thing because i saw exponential distribution so if i know the variance i know everything it would be like this i just square it and average and now if i look at the equation of motion for the particle that has stokes number st1 this is this and again what i do is i multiply both side by v1 i dot i do a dot product of both side by v1 and take the average and in the stationary state what i would have is this average should go to zero the average on the light, right left hand side because uh, basically the mean velocity just fluctuate about, uh, about a constant and then i get this u dot v correlator is equals to v1 square correlator so that was the problem in this first expression that i i did not know about this correlation correlation function so now i know this that this is just the v v1 square i plug it in here and what i get is this so this tells you that the relative velocity is just the difference of the rms speeds uh, of the two i mean the variance is just the difference of the variance of the two not the sum if they are like ideal gas molecule they then instead of minus you will see a plus sign here and with some factors so this is what we find for stokes number 1 so here i mean you can also if you like you can i will i won't go into the detail if, so i was considering that one particle is almost like a tracer particle it, it moves with the flow velocity but if it has a slightly larger stokes number so i can do a taylor expansion and i can uh, get a higher order uh, basically the first or next order uh, correction in the stokes number and the expression that you get is given here so uh, i'll uh, if you look at the right side plot the red i plot this uh, data for stokes number 1 equals to point 0.1 stokes number 2 equals to point 0.1 and as a function of stokes 1 the red points are data the blue one is just this term here which is the leading order correction and the green one is after adding the first order correction in the stokes 2 and you see that it becomes slightly more close to the actual data but i mean the, our leading order correction is also kind of does a reasonably good job <clears throat> so that is what i wanted to talk about and here is the summary what i said so basically if you want to understand the collision you need to look at the relative velocity that was clear and what we find is that the pdf of the relative velocity have a power law part that means two nearby particles can have very high relative velocity and the joint distribution takes that very simple form that in one region it becomes independent of r in the other region it becomes independent of vr and there's a line vr equals to z star r that separates these two regions and basically when the two stokes numbers are different then uh, if the difference is small then the qualitative nature of the this joint pdf remains the same above certain scales vr uh, rc and vc 
and we look at the de uh, dependence of these two scales on various parameters. And if uh, your theta is one, that means if your difference between the two strokes is very large, then also we have a kind of uh, uh, <coughs> perturbative expansion of the relative velocity between the two. <coughs> so that's all. Now I welcome your questions. Okay, thanks, Akshay.